has that friend, the one who doesn't date, has never dated, has never had a boyfriend or girlfriend, the shy one, the awkward one, and that friend probably never talks about it. That friend just pretends to be fine. I was that friend. I really don't know how I got that way, and I'm still trying to unravel the complicated tangle in my head. I do know about the years of silence, the shame, the lonely feeling that there was nobody else out there like me. When I was 27, I took a plane from the Bay Area to San Diego, got on a trolley, got off on Bayer Boulevard, and was driven across the Mexican border by a nun. I was a white girl from the Bay Area who had the San Francisco vision of Mexico in her mind. Frida Kahlo, San Miguel de Allende, Chiapas. I was nervous about TJ. It's had that dangerous reputation for years. People told me TJ was no place for a person like me. Everyone told me, the border is dirty and bad, not the real Mexico. They're gonna kill you. <laughs> they shoot people there. And the American vision of TJ was this place no one actually lived. It was like the Wild South. <laughs> Before he dropped me off at the Oakland airport, my dad said, I don't know why you must go to the armpit of the world, but you've always been different. <laughs> But something about all the warnings and racist paranoia made me dig my heels in. The more people warned me off, the more I wanted to go to TJ. I had to know what it was like in that crazy border town, that place full of sin and drugs and crime and drunkenness. But I wasn't just running into adventure and danger. I was running away from things, and I wasn't alone. Most of the volunteers I met were running from something. Show me a Peace Corps volunteer and I'll show you a messed up weirdo. <laughs> we get to front like we are making the world a better place, but deep down we are hoping each new place will offer that thing we need. We were a mixture of Germans and Americans, a long string of alcoholics, bitter divorcees, hippies, and closeted gay boys. It seemed that every single one of us was messed up or hiding something. I thought if I could balance on the edge of the knife of that dangerous city, maybe I could also figure out a few things about myself, like why I never had relationships and why I was drifting toward 30 with no real career in mind. I worked for a year in an after-school program called the Bosco. We did homework with the kids, fed them lunch, played sports, did crafts. They weren't street kids. They had families and houses. Most of their parents worked in the Sony factory on the hill above town. I learned quickly that a Mexican childhood, at least in this little town, seemed in some way superior to an American childhood. Kids ran free everywhere, all ages. They were sent on errands. They wandered the unpaved streets in happy packs. Everywhere I went, they would call my name. Patty! <laughs> in that way, it was the safest place I've ever lived. My roomie was Diana. When I met her, she was serving lunch to a long table of schoolgirls who stared at me and gave me shy smiles. Diana had a wide grin and was easily affectionate with the kids. She said, you can help me serve them lunch. And I jumped in, dishing out mac and cheese and filling plastic cups with water. The kids asked for jalapenos on their mac and cheese. <laughs> she and I looked at each other and grinned, okay. I knew we would be friends. Over the next few months, I got my bearings, learned how to say the alphabet in Spanish, learned how to eat candy crusted in chile powder, learned what bribes work to get kids to do their homework. This town wasn't the Frida Kahlo, San Francisco version of Mexico of my fantasies. It was something better. It was the border. It was dusty. It was smelly. And it was full of hugs and laughter. Tecolote was a small town, 20 minutes from the heart of the city by taxi. But the way into any culture is the kids. And once the kids knew me, I felt like a rock star. 
With the kids, I could be myself, be confident, and they adored me, which I soaked up and needed badly. Diana and I started going out in Tijuana. The streets at night were full of life. We would drink, and then we would dance, and then I would keep drinking. <laughs> Diana would always meet some boy, a bartender, a student, a guy in the taxi. It didn't matter. <laughs> they would talk, and I would watch them. She'd shake her long, hun honey blonde hair. Ha, ha, ha. I'd order another beer and look for something in my purse. <laughs> Sweaty hands, thudding heart. Around kids, I could be free and chatty, but around men, I was a shy introvert of the worst order. Once I watched her talking to a boy on Revolucion, and I stood and looked at the oil slick on a puddle of water in the gutter. <laughs> and I thought that made me special and artistic. <laughs> because I noticed the iridescence and the rainbow the oil made on the water's surface. <laughs> then I got real and told myself, you're standing over a gutter instead of talking to boys like a normal person, you fucking weirdo. <laughs> Diana started crushing on a really cute boy named Chacho who hung with the cholos in the skinny shade of the elementary school during the day. Have you ever looked at his eyes? They are so beautiful, deep brown. No, I had never looked at his eyes because I never made eye contact with cute boys. I could see that he was confident, cool, and tough. Chacho had confided in her about his life. It was rough. Mom was a junkie, big brother in prison. He was selling drugs here and there, but mostly just hanging around. She would say, he's a good guy. I was scared of him because he ran with the cholos, but also in the way I was mostly scared of good-looking guys. <laughs> if Diana did notice my shy oddness, she never commented, for which I was grateful. I was so ashamed of my awkwardness, and I didn't know how to talk about it, so I just pretended I was fine. I had to get very drunk to shake my reserve and dance and talk to guys, but that felt empty and hollow somehow, and I wouldn't remember much. On Thursdays, we had volunteer night at the house we shared with two American nuns. I was a Catholic girl, so nuns don't weird me out. While I hated the obedience, the subjugated role of women, I liked the blood and drama of Catholicism. <laughs> These nuns were hardworking women who were passionately committed to social justice. They lived in the real world with us. So once a week, we would have a group dinner of iceberg lettuce and frozen lasagna and just socialize. There was usually no booze, but tonight we were treated to a few caguamas of tecate. We all squeezed in lots of lime and some salt. Even one of the nuns poured herself a beer. While we loaded up our plates, one of the nuns popped her head in and said, girls, come in the other room. We need to talk to you about something. Diana and I looked at each other. Huh. We sat down in the TV room, paper plates on our lap. Several German volunteers, all male, sat quietly in a semicircle. Diana and I sat facing them, blinking. The oldest nun started. <clears throat> Diana. You are a very pretty girl, and you might not have much experience with people, so we wanted to give you some warning. There's been talk about you, and we need to let you know. We've been hearing that you socialize a lot with the cholos down by the school. I looked at Diana. She was looking back at the nun and nodding. She nervously took a drink of beer, and I did too. The nun went on. There was a girl raped last year out in the campo. You have to be careful. You can't give these boys ideas. They see a pretty American girl and they just think, well, Americans have a reputation for being, uh, she drifted off. The nun was obviously disturbed by the whole talk. Everyone had stopped eating. I could hear people shift in their chairs. Time kind of slowed down, the way it does when you are really uncomfortable. I started to get mad. Life isn't like that, I wanted to say. It's not a girl's fault what guys think, and some other righteous feminist stuff I couldn't think of at the time, but I just looked at my plate. 
Why were they talking to us like that? The other sister started talking about how the boys would misunderstand Diana's friendliness. You just have to be careful who you talk to, she said. It was a warning I'd heard since childhood, a warning all women deal with. The wolf is waiting for you. Be careful. Then I noticed something. They weren't addressing any of this to me. Everyone in the room was looking at Diana. She had a weird frozen smile on her face. No one was telling me to be careful. I was already careful. <laughs> I was practically a nun myself. <laughs> and now they were acting like that was some good thing, like I was safer for it and better than Diana. The nuns kept talking. Rape, be careful, you're an outsider. People watch what you do. Americans, reputation, cholos, rape, flirting, smiling, rape, too friendly. And the word that no one said hung there between us, slut. Diana reached for her empty beer and desperately tried to drink one more drop. The nuns kept talking. We get it. She gets it, I wanted to say, but I didn't. I wanted to say to them, she's fine. She is normal. She flirts with guys. That's what straight women our age do. It was so embarrassing to be the girl that nuns thought was being sensible and behaving. <laughs> I wanted to be like Diana. Couldn't they see that? When they were done talking, the nuns went to bed and the other volunteers left. Diana and I sat on the patio to finish the beer and smoke. We had been avoiding each other's eyes, but now we looked at each other and let out all our laughter and shock. What the fuck was that, Diana <laughs> asked. Are they serious? I don't know, I said. I'm not taking advice from nuns. I hope they know that, <laughs> she said. And that was kind of racist. They think just because these guys are Mexican, they are going to hurt us. So stupid. Yeah, what was that rape story, I said. Was that made up? I don't know. She shook her head. It was hard to know what to say. We both felt bad for our own private reasons. The thing I couldn't tell her was that I had thought the very thing the nuns had said. She should be more careful. She's too flirty. She should be cautious, like me. And now I thought how messed up that was. Was I like them? Was I afraid in the same ways that they were afraid? I couldn't tell Diana that I had judged her. It felt too awful. I only wanted her to be safe. But at the same time, I wished I was talking to cute cholos and meeting boys in bars. So what? Was I envious? How could I want to be like her and want to curb her behavior at the same time? We sat and drank and smoked. We started to get cold and talked about going inside. We drank a little more beer. We looked at the stars and listened to the dogs bark. We didn't talk about it anymore. A week later, a friend wrote me a letter and included a clipping that showed women's shoes and pink crosses in the deserts of Juarez. Hundreds of women were getting raped and cut and killed there. Girls, as young as 11. It was terrifying. There was so much that could happen to you in the world and so many voices telling you how to prevent it. It didn't matter how much you flirted or didn't flirt. It didn't matter how pretty or ugly you were, how fun or how shy. There would always be things to be afraid of. There would always be holes in our hearts into which we would pour prayer or beer or boys or the hugs of children. Nothing was enough. The nuns couldn't make Diana safe, neither could I. In all my guardedness, I knew I was no safer than she was. Tijuana wasn't safe for people like us, but neither was any place else. Thank you.